Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I know that our audience consists of two main groups of people. The first group are company owners. The second group are people who haven't started a company yet, but are thinking about it. While we normally focus on the first group, I felt it was important to encourage the second group. So this episode is about why you should be an entrepreneur. I had a great chat with Alex Armitage, a serial entrepreneur who's currently focused on Nectarine Credit, which helps companies automate credit applications when dealing with manufacturing partners. Alex is a non-traditional guy who's lived and traveled abroad while working for other companies and decided to finally leave the corporate world to start his own business after the financial crisis. He graciously shares his story, and through it, I hope you'll gain insight into how entrepreneurs think about their careers and their life, so that by the end of the episode, you'll have a great sense for why you too should become an entrepreneur. And now, I bring you Alex Armitage. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Alex. I appreciate it. And hopefully people who are listening that still have their own jobs and are thinking about starting a company can get some encouragement to take the first step by the end of this episode. Happy to be here. So I think we all have gone through this process of being a wage slave and have wanted to start a company. Some of us do, some of us don't. It took me years to get there. I'd like to know a little bit about your story quickly and how you went from being an employee, getting the idea you want to leave, and then actually doing it. And we'll stop there. Totally great question. For me, yeah, I worked in the corporate world for, I don't know, a couple decades almost and some big companies. I worked for Bloomberg and uh, they were a great company to work for. I worked for them in uh, New York, Princeton, New Jersey, Los Angeles, and London. They were booming. That company was doing really, really well. And they still are, obviously, to this day. I was a financial journalist, so it was an amazing time to be working for them. The only thing is, I, I think in the back of my mind, is I always felt a little bit stuck. Just didn't quite know why. You know, eventually, there was the 2008 credit crisis. And, you know, I think the writing was just sort of on the wall. It was time for me to just move on. I didn't jump right from Bloomberg to being an entrepreneur. It still took me a little while. I had the travel bug. And so I, I left Bloomberg and traveled for about a year and a half. And I was living in London at the time and traveled all over Europe, did a big sailing trip, traveled around Africa for about seven months with my now wife. Yeah. And it was just eye opening. The whole experience was great. And eventually moved back to Europe, lived in Amsterdam, worked for some more corporate jobs in Amsterdam and worked for some SaaS data providers and a couple contracts and uh, still felt a little stuck the whole time. And it was only until I moved to Vancouver in Canada and couldn't get a job. I had all this international experience at some huge, well-respected companies, leaders in their fields. And I was basically told that I needed local experience, which I didn't even no, that was necessary unless maybe you were like working in a restaurant or something or selling to restaurants or that kind of thing. I was unhirable. You know, I just couldn't get hired and I just had a couple ideas for businesses and I figured, you know, if not now, when am I going to do this? So I, I launched an e-commerce company in the natural product space, then launched another e-commerce company in the natural product space. I launched a SaaS company that eventually fizzled. I've never felt so like at home, I think, being an entrepreneur. I love the buzz, the excitement, the sort of like choosing your own path, not answering to anybody except your customers, of course. 
Yeah. And so, so that's what got me to the entrepreneurial life. And I've since started even another company. So I'm onto my fourth company now, and that's where I'm spending all of my time these days. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> it's what you felt. And so that's what matters, right? The unhirable anecdote that I gave, I mean, that was sort of the, the gateway drug, if you will. That was the entrance to it. And then being an entrepreneur opened up all these you know, amazing options for me. It was like a, a fog that lifted once I realized being unhirable was not a bad thing. At first, I, I was certainly excited about it, but I also was scared, you know, as soon as I had even the slightest bit of success, not even like my first customer, but, you know, say, for example, launching a website, I was like, this is freedom. Like, I have a website. I didn't know I could do that. And, you know, of course, it's a slippery slope. It's it's one thing after another. And, you know, you just have to like the process. In my mind, being an entrepreneur is like managing problems. There's so many problems. You know, even if you're hugely successful, there's massive problems, which I didn't know when I was younger. I would watch my dad work and I just thought like, how does he do this? It's one problem after another. I read a story the other day about Richard Branson. He lives on Necker Island in Caribbean, I think. You know, he has like a meeting every morning, but he goes for a walk. And then he has a, a meeting for the daily crisis. And I'm like, Richard Branson has daily crisis? You know, the answer, of course, is of course he does. Like it's managing problems. Being an entrepreneur is managing problems. But the positive side is like it opens up opportunities. It opens up options for you. There's freedom. There's just this amazing, amazing sense of accomplishment. I just couldn't get at a company you know, like working for somebody else. Like I didn't realize any of this until I did it. I know it now looking back, working for big companies. The more success you have, the more problems you have to deal with. But if you are humble enough to accept that you can't do it alone and you have the means to hire good people, you can make most of the problems their responsibility. <laughs> and so the problems you focus on are, are of a higher level of importance. So I feel like the, the role of the entrepreneur is to do something and learn how to do it well until you can't do it anymore. And then you hire someone who's better than you to come on and do it. And you know that they are better than you because you've done it. And then you can shift your focus to things that are more important, to problems that are more important. I agree 100%. I mean, doing it till you just like have hit your limit or you realize you're being inefficient and you could be spending your time doing something that you're better at and then delegating, hiring and delegating. You know, with my latest venture, Nectarine Credit, it's a business credit application management software. I have a CTO. I mean, there's just no way I could be a CTO. I mean, I could if that, that was my job, if that's what I wanted to be, but I'm I'm trying to build a bigger company and I'm trying to build strategy and direction. And you can't do that. You can't be a CEO and a CTO at the same time. And I mean, you certainly could in the very early days, but we're, we're beyond that and we're getting traction and we're moving forward. And so you have to delegate and it's super cliche. It's, it's annoyingly cliche that you have to hire good people, but it's, it's so true. I hear people say that and I roll my eyes, but it, it is true. You just, you have to hire people that you trust and that are, you know, that just go way above and beyond the call of duty. I feel like, especially in Asia, where I, I think, you know, I've got a good number of uh, audience members, it's very, very, very hard for someone to leave a career without their parents and their grandparents and their siblings and their friends giving them so much shit because society in Asia is like, you get a job, you get married. It's very similar to America, but Americans also have this deep-seated education of go be different, go be unique, go innovate, go create something, where this concept is still quite new in Asia. It's hard to break out of that mold. I didn't take the conventional path, and I don't think I ever really have. Like, I didn't really have a plan, like, I'm going to quit, travel for a year and a half and start a company. Like, I did love that job. Like, it was amazing, but I just knew it was time. I traveled for a year and a half, and then I worked for a few other companies and basically instantly fell back into that feeling of, like, I need to be doing something more. I had, like, bigger dreams. I didn't quite know what they were, but I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to, like, feel that freedom. But a lot of this you don't know till you've been there, right? Till you've like launched your first company, sold your first product, you've gotten your first contract, whatever the case may be. I, I think once you realize that being an entrepreneur and starting companies is what you want, it's there's sort of no turning back. You know, you know how you hear about these like entrepreneurs who sell their companies for 
many millions. They have an earn out. They have to stick around the purchasing company for one or two years. They almost always leave the day they get their payout, right? After their earn out, their two years or whatever. You know, working for other people is like prison for entrepreneurs. <laughs> That's how I feel. It's not easy at all. So let's go back to the first e-commerce company. How did you come up with that? Because as you were saying, I think it's quite common. And even for me, when I first did my, my company, I didn't know what I wanted to do and you didn't know what you wanted to do. So how did you come to a place mentally where you said, I want to do an e-commerce company? Because I feel like everyone has their own goals. Some people want to have a physical shop somewhere. Some people want to have a software company. Some people want to do drop shipping. So everyone has a different goal inevitably. But how did you get to your first business? And was it related to your lifestyle goals? Or did you completely ignore that and just said, I want to do e-commerce? And how did you get there? What happened was, is that when I moved to Vancouver, I had a a job. I did get a job and it was just a contract working in basically sales and marketing for a little sports company. And I was in contact with a lot of independent sales reps in the sports community. So it was Vancouver, lots of guys who sold skis and ski boots for big companies. You can imagine the Nikes of the world, not really Nike, but the smaller companies have independent reps selling into stores. And I met a lot of these guys. I was building out a wholesale network for a company that sold outdoor sports gear. I actually like just met a guy on the floor of a store and he was telling me, you remember those like five, they were called Vibram five-fingered shoes that were popular a decade ago. They were like five toes. Yeah, so I met a guy and he was the rep. He was just telling me how that business was booming and they were going to do a hundred million in sales. And I just like, couldn't believe it. I said, well, the biggest problem with that business is don't these shoes just like completely stink? And he said, yeah, but there's, you know, there's no solution for that. I just like had this like moment of, you know, light bulb. And I was like, there's no solution. Athletes like natural products. And so I just went home. And in fact, I think I just turned around after the conversation ended and like just started Googling like natural skincare, natural body care, natural foot and shoe deodorizers. There was nothing out there. Like nothing came up on Google. I pretty much decided on the spot. I'm just going to try this. Like, why not? If people are buying these little, you know, now they're sort of goofy. But at the time, I, I also felt they were a bit goofy. I was like, if people are buying these, like there's got to be a solution to this. Like I can launch something. And I did. And it was like one product and then it was three and then it was six and then it was dozens and eventually got into like, you know, other natural products. It was just an, an opportunity I saw and I thought my original plan was just to do it on the side, but it just took off. It was like one thing after another. And I was like, I don't need a job. And I didn't want a job at that point because I was having fun and enjoying it. You know, it was just amazing to like, it moved quickly. It was like three to six months and it took off. And I was like, okay, here we are. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur. I just woke up one day and it sort of occurred to me. And I was like, I really enjoy this. This is way more exciting. And yeah, like I said before, it was a slippery slope. All companies are born out of problems, right? Companies solve problems. You, know, you just have to think about problems. Like where are the pinch points in your life and where are the pain points? What causes you trouble? That's work for me almost every time. If you look at big successful companies, that's what it is. It's problems that have been solved by software, products, services, and what have you. Yeah, the problem that I was trying to solve was that I had been used to being a very social person as a teacher and an HR manager. And all of a sudden, I was by myself at home alone for months. I had no, you know, I wasn't really going out. I was declining invitations to do things. I just was feeling horrible. And this thing gave me an opportunity to go and be in, you know, not exactly in the front, but to do something that could be big in a way that also solves a social problem, which was that in China, young people are very stressed and they didn't have much of a social outlet for intellectual stimulation. And so the speech events we were doing were completely promoted in English. The speeches were in English. So people that went had to have a very high level of English. And it gave them the opportunity to meet people they would normally never meet. The hope was that they would put their phones down for a few hours on a Sunday and just focus on listening to other people's experiences and meeting other people that are unique to them that maybe they find they have more, more things in common with than they would normally think and hopefully establish friendships and all that. So it was really like a social enterprise project. And it was a wild success. I'm still close with many of the people who are volunteers and 
you know, the people that saw what I was doing from the beginning and decided to support me, I'm still close with many of them. And I would have never met them if it, I hadn't done this. That's a whole nother angle we haven't even chatted about is like, you just meet really interesting people. In fact, I would say that's one of the most important things. I meet interesting people related to my startups like all the time over LinkedIn, over Twitter, follow people I wouldn't have normally followed. Man, just get out and find interesting people to talk to, you know, like at startup events. I mean, hopefully we're seeing the end of COVID and we can start doing those, those kind of meetings, meet ups are just invaluable just finding people are doing interesting things just cool cool stuff as you were saying doing that and being the founder of a platform kind of like i'm doing with the podcast puts me in a position that people want to meet me they want to talk with me they want to get to know me and through that i get a chance to help them it's also this kind of extended network of people that are just like in the trenches doing their own thing, but also moving at the same time in the same direction kind of a thing. And the same pace, right? Like for our talk, I emailed you and you replied in like two seconds. I emailed another entrepreneur yesterday and he, he replied back like seconds after I hit send. I replied to him. I just, the pace is exciting. You get a lot done when you're an entrepreneur and being nimble and just the feedback you get, you know, meeting cool people, doing cool things. Like it's just everyone's elevated, right? By this high octane lifestyle, if you will. What's something I haven't asked you about or what is something that you'd like to share that I haven't asked about? It's not related to like leaving a job, but it's related to the same buzz, you know, if you will, that you get from being an entrepreneur and uh, solving problems. That's why I started Nectarine Credit was like, I've been working on these other e-commerce companies for some time and, you know, certainly haven't like lost that buzz, but was looking for something new again. And, you know, we saw a problem. Nectarine Credit was born out of those problems that we saw running our e-commerce companies. You know, we were basically filling out paper and emailed credit applications a bunch of times a week. We have suppliers, we would go to them, say we want to buy X number of widgets, and they would say, fill out these paper credit applications and we'll give you credit. I just thought like, how, why is this being done by paper and fax? They were asking us to fax them back. Talk about the exact opposite of what we were just talking about, the, the sort of pace. I just like, I just refuse to fax anything. And so we built a platform that speeds up this process and it's automated and we're connected to 10,000 banks. This process, it was old and broken and bank verification would take sometimes months and sometimes it wouldn't, it wouldn't even work. We fixed this, we've automated the process and we're helping customers. We've solved that problem for them this old antiquated process. And I, that's what I love about being an entrepreneur is that like the problem solving and the pace of speeding things up from a system that used to be broken. The funny thing about living in Asia is that they have horrible problems in this regard. A lot of things they use are broken. And when I ask questions about why, they just get mad. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Like, just accept it. You're in Asia. It's like, that's not how you fix things. That's not how you have change. That's not how you move a society forward. If you don't ask those questions, then how are you going to do anything? Like, what's the point of living if you're not trying to fix things? As I mentioned, I lived in, in Europe for four and a bit years as a, an American living there. You know, you go to France and I didn't live in France, but, you know, I've heard stories of like people trying to get internet access and they're like, it takes weeks or months. And I don't know if that's still the case, but certainly like eight or nine years ago, it would take sometimes months to get internet access. And obviously you can't start an internet you know, service provider in France super easily because of certain laws and rules. But like the people who are trying to do that are solving problems. And uh, that sort of acceptance that things are slow and faxed and take forever is frustrating. And that's what entrepreneurs and startup companies are trying to fix is that like, you know, we're trying to smooth out that process and, you know, hopefully make some money in the process along the way. Yeah, that's why I'm working on uh, internal team collaboration. Because I knew that the future of work was remote and decentralized eight years ago when I started doing it myself. Eight years ago, what do you have? You, you barely had smartphones at that time. They were like maybe two years old, three years old. So you didn't really have these tools you have today. These web apps, there weren't really many web apps or SaaS companies back then either. So most of the, the ways that you communicated was email and Skype. You want to have a, a call overseas, you use Skype. Otherwise, you use email. Like, that's it. A lot of companies, especially in Asia today, they're still using Skype or they're using WhatsApp for communicating with all of their team members. Like, 
how can you possibly manage a team of 40 people inside of WhatsApp? I just don't see it. So there's a lot of education that needs to go on in order to get Asia up to speed at a business level compared to the US and other countries in the West. So I think there's a massive potential for us in in this vertical, in this region. That's the thing is there's so many inefficiencies and processes that are manual and slow or inefficient and just, I mean, even things that we think are efficient now because they've gotten to a point where we're moving beyond it, right? Like email is obviously, it's not going away anytime soon, but certainly there's a lot of apps like what you're developing and, you know, various other platforms that are changing the way we communicate, but but changing everything. And that's, to me, that's what's exciting about entrepreneurial life is that like fixing these problems. I lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years and an expression there is it's impossible. You know, you would just go into a store or whatever, a bank, and you would ask for like, you know, a new credit card or whatever. And they would just say, it's impossible. (laughs) The Dutch are like very commerce driven. They're merchants, right? They also are set it in their ways. It was quite funny. I found that they would say it's impossible. And basically it was like, they just, you'd hear that quite a bit. And when Dutch would say that it was very much, they weren't telling you it was impossible. They're just telling this is just the way it's been done. They're, they're not going to change it for you. So how can people follow up with you? They can follow me on Twitter, which is just at Alex Armitage. They can shoot me an email at alex at nectarinecredit.com. And chat to me on LinkedIn as well. If you like this episode, definitely contact Alex. Uh, Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you haven't started your first company yet and you're thinking about doing it, just know that it's very hard and very worth it. But you have to stick with it. But before you can stick with it, you have to try it. Thank you.